At the opening ceremonies of the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, seen via satellite all around the globe, pop singer Celine Dion performed a brand new song composed by Canadian David Foster entitled The Power of a Dream. Much in the song epitomizes the Olympic ideal. The games do bring people together. Athletes and their sponsoring nations hope and pray that somehow a new global peace might break out because of the goodwill of the two weeks in Atlanta. Can we as a planet somehow jump that high bar? We wonder. Can we break the world records of bombs and violence and racism? But think about the plain truth that people have been looking inside themselves for thousands of years and still haven't found the solution to world peace there. Although people have always searched their own souls for the power of some dream, wars continue to rage just like before. Peace and love don't appear to reside naturally in the human soul. I have to imagine that David Foster had his new song all composed and arranged long before the Olympic torch was lit on a Friday evening there in Atlanta. The cast of hundreds probably rehearsed that line about the world uniting in hope and peace prior to the Wednesday leading up to the Olympic Games. But remember, just a few days later, Right in the middle of the games themselves, a pipe bomb went off in Centennial Square. As we wrap up our tour of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's bring just one verse to the table. Verse 3 is actually the kind of passage we might almost all call a throwaway. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read through some of the New Testament letters, you almost consider a verse like that to be the equivalent of a, how are you doing? Or a, God bless you, after a sneeze. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians has the exact same greeting. In fact, it's verse 3 again. Ditto in his letters to the Christians in Galatia, Ephesians, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and Thessalonica, and to Timothy, Titus, Philemon, grace and peace. But knowing the intensity with which Paul preached and wrote, I have to believe the expression actually meant something to the apostle. Two words tell us something about the missing ingredient, even in that heartwarming Olympic song, grace and peace to you. From God. Have you ever considered that real peace, real peace, is an active, hands-on gift to you and me from God? That's what Paul's saying here in all of these letters. Peace to you from God. You and I can read through the history books of any nation or civilization and find out that well, human beings cannot look inside themselves and find peace, nor can they manufacture it. They've tried. But even though we may like Celine Dion's song and cling to the power of a dream, if it's only a dream for peace, it's not going to come from Olympic athletes or by looking in a mirror. As we study 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, two other verses are pertinent. Over in John chapter 14, verse 27, on the Thursday evening before his crucifixion, Jesus tells his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Notice again that peace comes from Jesus Christ. Human beings don't find it within themselves or through soul searching. In fact, all of the evidence indicates that the more the disciples looked in their own hearts, the worse they became. That very evening, they'd all searched their own souls and every single one of them decided 
He wanted to be top dog in the new earthly kingdom. They were sure Jesus was about to set up. Every time these guys looked in the mirror for the power of a dream, it was a dream of control and ego feeling and power tripping. That's why Jesus says with absolute clarity, I don't give you the kind of peace the world talks about. Pop music radio stations all around the world croon about peace while homemade bombs blow up the very cars in which the radios are playing the music. The second confirmation of this biblical truth comes from a most unlikely source, the prophet Jonah. Jonah 4 tells us how after God has forgiven the sinful people of Nineveh, gladly decided he doesn't have to destroy them after all, the prophet goes into a major league pout. In verse 2, he protests, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. That's quite a complaint, isn't it? Lord, I knew you were going to send peace instead of destruction. I knew you were a peace lover and a peacemaker and a peace sender. Jonah almost says, I can't trust a God like that. Well, Jonah's complaint is our celebration, isn't it? But how, do we allow God to give us peace? As we read 1 Corinthians here, it's clear that real peace comes to us through the Christian message, through the story of the cross. In fact, as we read verse 3 for the third time, notice what it says. Grace and peace to you from God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul almost starts pounding the pulpit. In the next chapter, he declares, you need Jesus. You need to boast in the Lord. I'm resolved to preach nothing among you except Christ crucified. Now, I've been in an underground Christian gathering, literally underground. Actually, it was in an old chicken coop in which refugee believers were present from Rwanda, bitterest enemies, Hutus and Tutsis, worshiping together not killing each other. Same in the former communist countries. Some of these had experienced political repression such as you and I will never know. The leaders in their pulpit boroughs had searched in their hearts for peace and instead tortured anyone who confessed the name of Christ. How did Christians still have peace? The kind of peace I saw shining in their eyes and heard them tell about with their own lips. I want to tell you it was the most moving worshiping experience I've ever had in my life there in Africa. Hutus and Tutsis, refugees. How? It's that Christian message, an understanding of the meaning of the cross. The fact that you may know you are now forgiven is no matter if you're persecuted in this world, you have a home in heaven. That you have an identity as a child of God, whether you win a gold medal in the Olympics or go home empty handed. That you have not just the peace that is a gift from God, but also the grace that is equally a gift from our Father. That's 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4. Peace. One Bible commentary has said about the biblical word translated as peace. The salvation that Christ's redemptive work will achieve for his disciples total well-being and inner rest of spirit in fellowship with God. 
And then it adds, all true peace is his gift. Now there's a line someone should write a song about. Thank you.